Greetings. On behalf of the Holocaust Remembrance Foundation of the Valley and the March of Remembrance Murrieta, I want to welcome you to our 2020 Holocaust Memorial. It was only a few short weeks ago that our planning committee was working hard to put together a program for our seventh annual March of Remembrance. Who could have predicted that in such a short time things would change so radically? But here we are. The March of Remembrance was founded eight years ago with two purposes. One is to remember and to honor those who died in the Holocaust, the six million Jewish people who perished in the Holocaust. The second purpose is to raise awareness and to bring attention to anti-Semitism in our current society. Judging by the rise in attendance over the seven years and the acceptance by our local community, the March of Remembers has been a success. And as our committee was facing these restrictions that were placed upon us, where we were not allowed to have a public gathering, we determined that we were still going to have our Holocaust Memorial event. We were going to do it dealing with the circumstances that we have. Therefore, we have put together the following program for you, our faithful partners and supporters. Remembering the Holocaust, 2020. Our first speaker I'd like to introduce to you is Dr. Hillel Newman. Dr. Newman is the current Council General for the Israeli um, Consulate in Los Angeles. And he has honored us by providing us with a video sharing some thoughts with us about the lessons that can be learned from the Holocaust. So together let's Welcome Dr. Newman and watch his video together. Hi everyone, my name is Hillel Newman and I am the Consul General of Israel here in Los Angeles, responsible for the Southwestern region of the United States. It is really my honor to join you in this March of Remembrance ceremony or gathering in honor of the memory of the Holocaust uh, of the Muretta region. I thank you for the invitation to be a part I'd like to open my words just mentioning my personal connection uh, to the Holocaust. My father actually was born in Czechoslovakia and he managed to get out of Czechoslovakia after the Nazis had already conquered his city. But the majority of his family perished in the Holocaust. Uh, this fact accompanied him and me throughout my life. Um, I felt on a daily basis how this aspect of his family perished in the Holocaust influenced his daily decisions on what he does and what he doesn't do and how he builds meaning to his life as one of the sole survivors of his family. It is a fascinating story actually of how he was actually saved by in incidental people that came across his path and uh, saved him. This has also been part of my life and I grew up, as one would say, in a family of Holocaust survivors. They talk about the second generation and the third generation of Holocaust survivors. In many ways, I feel that I belong to this family. Um, I have drawn a few lessons from the Holocaust. And the lessons that I have drawn from the Holocaust, I would say, are three main central lessons. The first is we should look at the fact that out of the ashes of the Holocaust, the State of Israel was born, re-established. This is a fascinating aspect of the Holocaust. We say in Hebrew, Mishoah Litkuma, from the Holocaust to renewal, to renewal and to rebuilding. Rebuilding of a life, rebuilding of a state, rebuilding of a nation. I think that the lesson from this is that we should never give up hope. And even from the darkest periods and the lowest steps in life, fascinating things can be born. The second lesson that I have taken from the Holocaust is that everything should be taken seriously. You know, the Holocaust began with the verbal abuse of Jews, 
verbal attacks against Jews, moved on from there to vandalizing of shops, prohibition of work of Jews, and ended in the end with the burning of Jews. Everything must be taken seriously. And even in the Los Angeles area, we have seen attacks and vandalizing of synagogues. We have seen graffiti, and some say, well, it's not that important, it's only graffiti. But everything should be taken seriously. Everything is significant. From graffiti, we can in the end reach the burning of books and even the burning of flesh. And the third lesson that I have taken from the Holocaust is that we must trust ourselves and ourselves only. You know, the State of Israel had always a principle that no other boots will be on the ground in Israel. No other army or military force will stand and fight for Israel. Israel will stand and fight for itself. In many ways, the state of Israel was, was born in a kind of defiant position. We made the world accept our existence. This is part of the whole principle of the state of Israel, that the Jews now must stand for themselves and make sure that they can protect themselves and defend themselves at all times. Allow me to conclude with the message that the State of Israel stands for all Jews wherever they are. We stand with Jews here in the Jewish communities. We will fight and make sure that the Jewish communities have freedom and are free of any kind of attack or anti-Semitism. But the State of Israel also stands in Israel for the Jews. The Jews can always come and find a safe sanctuary in the State of Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Newman, for those very insightful thoughts. I trust that we'll all remember those three very important points that you made. Now I'd like to introduce William Bernstein. William Bernstein is the Regional Director for the Los Angeles um, Agency for Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem is the world's most important Holocaust museum. It's located in Jerusalem. Mr. Bernstein is their representative here in the West State, Western States. He is a friend of the March of Remembrance and the Holocaust Memorial. And so he has shared with us some thoughts in writing. And I've asked Dr. Alan Winkelstein if he will uh, re share those thoughts with us. So, Dr. Winkelstein, if you'll share those thoughts with us, thank you. Dear friends of the Southwest Riverside County community, I hope you and your family had a Zisin Pesach. It was a very different celebration this year for sure. The worldwide community will remember the Holocaust on April 21st. I know this is a very important date on your calendar. Therefore, I wanted to be in touch with you and share a few words of reflection as we prepare to honor the memory of the six million. I want to extend my thanks on behalf of the American Society for Yad Vashem and Yad Vashem in Jerusalem to all of those responsible for the outstanding work that has been accomplished towards the Holocaust Remembrance Educational Memorial. Your community has made great strides to ensure that the lessons of the Holocaust will never be forgotten, passed on from generation to generation. This year, during the Passover Seder, the recitation of the Ten Plagues took on special meaning, since we now ourselves are experiencing a plague that no one could have ever imagined. Similarly, the Jews of Eastern Europe during the time of the Holocaust could have never imagined that evil for forces would come their way, leading to the murder of six million. I take solace in the famous book written by the brilliant author and Holocaust survivor, Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. In this book, which has been sold, which has sold more than 10 million copies worldwide, Frankl chronicles his experiences as a prisoner in Nazi concentration camps and describes his psychotherapeutic method, which involved identifying a, a purpose in life to feel positive about and immersively imagining the outcome. Frankl's book can offer important guidance to us right now. Although we see enormous suffering, great despair, and death, we still can find something to be positive about and imagining, in the end, a positive outcome. Not easy to do, but worth the journey for certain. 
During these past few weeks, I've experienced a whole range of feelings and emotions. I have found that one way of managing them is to reach out to others in need and do my best to provide assistance. That can take many forms, a delivered meal to an elderly person, purchasing a few masks for a nurse or a doctor that may need them, and contributing to a local food bank. Yad Vashem is indebted to you for your assistance in building and growing the scope and purpose of the World Remembrance Center over many years. Our mission to educate the world about the lessons of the Holocaust will continue and grow stronger despite the recent worldwide pandemic. Often following moments like this in history, we find ourselves to be even more resolute in our efforts to transmit the message of tolerance and acceptance for individual differences and to eradicate discrimination wherever it may exist. In the end, we are indeed all in this together. Like Viktor Frankl, I can imagine a better tomorrow. My warmest regards for your good health and security in the weeks ahead. William S. Bernstein, Western Region Director, American Society for Yad Vashem. Senator Jeff Stone was one of our original speakers at our first March Remembrance seven years ago. Since then, he has been a faithful supporter and participant in all of our efforts to counter anti-Semitism and raise awareness of the Holocaust. We're pleased to have him back again this year and have asked him to share a personal story about what the Holocaust means to him. He's recently accepted a position with the U.S. Department of Labor as the Western Regional Director. So let's welcome Jeff Stone as he brings a personal testimony about his experience with the Holocaust. Hello everyone, this is former State Senator Jeff Stone and I hope that you all are doing well and staying healthy uh, during this pandemic. I was asked to uh, share with you some my feelings about Holocaust remembrance and you know we have a new generation of of kids that don't have relatives that were in the Holocaust and only believe what they read. And there are so many countries out there that want to pretend that the Holocaust never existed, that it's very important that we have testimonials like a like the one that I'm about to give you. My grandmother on my father's side, her mother, my great-grandmother, Molly Goldstein, was living in a shtetl in, in Poland and was alarmed when this extremist by the name of Adolf Hitler uh, was rising to power. And she became very concerned at a very young age. She was only about 16 years old, and she told her parents that they need to consider leaving Poland because this man is getting much more dangerous. Her family tried to calm her and basically say that we've seen anti-Semitism like this before and Adolf Hitler will be a passing phenomenon and, and not to worry. But as his power was growing and as he was invading his neighboring countries, my great-grandmother decided to leave Poland and she boarded a ship uh, for the United States and ultimately ended up in San Francisco where she had... Um, four kids, including my grandmother. And unfortunately, the remainder of her family all met their fate at the ovens at Auschwitz. When I grew up, my mom and dad educated me about the Holocaust and six million Jews were slaughtered, were gassed, were cremated with their possessions stolen all their property. And it was alarming just to hear as a young child that something like this could happen when I lived in the age of Disneyland. I lived in Anaheim, five miles away from the Disneyland Resort, where everything was happy. And to hear these sad stories was uh, very, dis very distressing. As I grew up and studied the Holocaust more and realized that it was a horrible event in human history, that I wanted to go to Auschwitz. I wanted to see it. I wanted to smell it. I wanted to feel the soil. I wanted to see where my ancestry, 25% of my ancestry perished. 
And about five or six years ago, my wife and I went to Auschwitz and we had a tour guide that was like a computer program to spit out the, the worst of the historical events that happened on the piece of property. It was a very gloomy, misty, cloudy day in Birkenau. Um, you could feel the, the depression and frankly, the, the darkness, uh, in the site. And so I saw the ovens where many of my family members were murdered. Many of our brethren, 6 million Jews met their fate. So it's our generations now that have to keep alive the, the memory of what happened in Auschwitz, because if we don't recall it, if we don't educate and indoctrinate our kids to understand that if you don't follow history, it has an opportunity to reoccur. And unfortunately, there are certain parts of the, the world where we do see uh, mass exterminations of people. And uh, we need to group together as human beings as all of mankind and say enough is enough that we're not going to tolerate this. So thank you all for coming together. And uh, thank you for hearing my story about my family and may God bless you and your families and hope that we never see this kind of atrocity ever again in our lives and in the future lives of our, gener our, our future generations. Thank you. Dr. Robert Giori was a friend of the March of Remembrance and a participant for the last four or five years. He <clears throat> was our featured speaker as a Holocaust survivor last year. We were all deeply saddened when he passed away last fall. So we've asked his wife, Marika, if she would please come and share some thoughts and some remembrance as a, about Dr. Giori. We're doing this to honor his name and to remember him as we prepare to recite the Kaddish prayer. So let's listen to Mrs. Giori as she tells us her memories of Robert. Um, hi, welcome, I'm glad you're here. And um, my name is Marika Giori, and my husband is Dr. Robert Giori. And uh, he was a child uh, Holocaust survivor and he used to tell the story when he was four years old, he was playing outside with the other boys and the boys beat him up and called him rotten Jews. And he went home and told her mother what happened. And mother said earlier to him not to play with those boys. And my husband was asking mom, you know, how they know I'm Jew, even I don't know I'm Jew. And there was his dad's brother, who was a joker, and he said, what is written on your forehead? And he went in the bedroom and checked his forehead in the mirror. So that was a time when he realized and he knew he's a Jew. And there is a other story what he used to say when he remembered for the safe house what was a ghetto. And at night, he had to go to the bedroom, but the bedroom was outside and is only one for everybody. And when he went outside and opened the door, a dead body fell on him. And he was screaming and, and running back to the room. And it was a very scary experience for him. Mm -hmm. well, my husband came to USA in 1956 after a revolution. All his life, he was working in the motion picture industry, and uh, he had four patent inventions that they're still using today. Um, he was a chief engineer at 20th Century Fox for 25 years, and he retired from them. Uh, he earned a Life Fellow membership for the uh, Motion Picture and Engineering Society. Yes. Um, uh, Dr. Giori didn't want to talk a lot about Holocaust because there was a lot of uh, testimony about it. But he wanted to point out uh, what happening today, right now. We say never again. But uh, today, 
Christians are slayed right now because of their beliefs. And um, nobody is doing anything about that. Just because we are different colors and have different beliefs, it doesn't make it okay for anybody to destroy the other person for the different beliefs. Mm -hmm. And when he goes to the school and speaking about the Holocaust for the children, he always tell them and told them, if you see something and you feel something, somebody is discriminating the other person just because they're different, no matter what the reason, then say, do something and don't be afraid. Well, on behalf of my husband, Dr. Robert Giori, I say thank you for building the Holocaust Education Memorial. And I thank you for commemorating my husband, Dr. Robert Giori. Thank you and God bless you. Many people are not aware of the strong connection of the Jewish people to the foundation of the city of Murrieta. After the Second World War and the horrors of the Holocaust, during the 1950s and 1960s, there was a migration of Jewish people to the area of Murrieta Hot Springs, centered around the spa in that area. And they were able to establish their synagogue and to have a community. And among those who uh, arrived in Murrieta, in Murrieta Hot Springs, were Holocaust survivors. And they became a part of the community and a vital part of the foundation of the city of Murrieta. So we want to honor them today as we prepare to recite the prayer, special Mourner's Cottage prayer. And so I'm going to recite their names as we uh, lift them up and remember them today. So, Cy and Sarah Carmelli, Harry Dates and Elsa Dates, Lena Auerbach, Herman Collette, Jack and Rita Chancy, uh, Charney, Rosa Goldfarb, Celia Stern, Gedalia and Esther Spitz, Gerda Rich, Mordecai and Esther Ackerman, Bella Weissman, Devorah Breacher, Hannah Breacher, David Breacher, Mina Breacher, Henry Guta, Nathan and Monique Bredsgrove, Motto and Leah Moskowitz, Moshe and Leah Weissman, Joseph and Rochelle Erderberg, Abraham and Fanny Olitsky, David Jaco, Model and Burl Klein, Stanley and Pearl Weisler, Bernard Caron, Saul Daziza, Bernard and Camilla Zelkowitz, David Francis and Francis Davis, Art Goldberg, and Dr. Robert Giori, and Mr. Henry Berger. And as we uh, transition now to the time when we are going to uh, introduce at the, our cantor today, our cantor, we're very fortunate to have with us, Alan Scharf, is a retired cantor from San Diego, and he is going to chant the El Male Rachamim and the Mourner's Kaddish in memory of our past loved ones. So let's uh, listen as, as Cantor Scharf chants our prayers today. The El Male Rachamim prayer is a prayer that is said to remember those who have passed away. I will read the English first before chanting in the Hebrew, and then the same for the mourner's Kaddish, which will follow. <clears throat> Exalted, compassionate God, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure to the souls of our brethren who perished in the Shoah, the Holocaust. Men, women, and children of the house of Israel who were slaughtered and suffocated and burned to ashes. May their memory endure and inspire deeds of charity and goodness in our lives. May their souls thus be bound up in the bond of life. May they rest in peace. And let us say, Amen.
May God's sovereignty soon be accepted during our life and the life of all Israel. And let us say, Amen. May God's great name be praised throughout all time, glorified and celebrated, lauded and worshipped, exalted and honored, extolled and acclaimed. May the Holy One, blessed be He, beyond all song and psalm, beyond all tributes, that mortals can utter, and let us say, Amen. Let there be abundant peace from heaven, with life's goodness for us and for all Israel, and let us say, Amen. May the one who brings peace to his universe bring peace to us and to all Israel, and let us say, Amen. Yitgadal v'yitgadash Shmei Rabba. Ve'amma divra chilutei ve'amlich machutei. B'chayei chon u'v'yom mechon u'v'chayei d'chol Beit Yisrael. Ba'gala u'v'zman kariv v'imru amen. Yehei shmei Rabba m'varach li'alam olalmei ul'maya. Yitbarach v'yishtabach Vit poar, vit romam, vit nase, vit adar, vit ale, vit alal, shemei du kudusha, brechu. La ela min kol birchata, vishirata, tush birchata, venechemata, da amiran bialma vimru amen. Yehei shlamar abam minchmaya, 
וחיים עלינו ועל כל ישראל ואמרו אמן. עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל ואמרו אמן. Thank you, Ken Tachar, for the beautiful rendition of our prayers this afternoon. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate you, our faithful partners and supporters, for being here with us for the seventh annual March of Remembrance Holocaust Memorial Commemoration. And when you think about it, all over the world, there are thousands who are gathering together, and we assume electronically, to do what we are doing today, to take time out to commemorate the Holocaust. So we can join together with them. Let's join our hearts together with them and declare to the world, never again. May that be a reality in our life, in the life to come. <clears throat> and as is our tradition, we end our service by singing Hatikva. And We've done it in several ways, but this year we have chosen to do something we did a few years ago, and that is to sing with the, the survivors at Bergen-Belsen when they were liberated, sang Hatikva, the hope. And so let's join together with them and their rendition of Hatikva. Yeah. 